In this video, we're going to look at the basics of centripetal motion. Now, the term centripetal actually means center pointing. And so whenever we're talking about centripetal motion, we're actually talking about a force that is pointing towards a center, towards the center of a circle, while a velocity is pointing tangential. You, for right now, might need to think of that as just pointing straight. Uh, and, and what ends up happening, remember acceleration, rate of change of velocity according to time, uh, force causes an acceleration. So if we're thinking about acceleration, rate of change, velocity according to time, three ways we can accelerate, speed up, slow down, or importantly, in this case, change direction. Our force, or the acceleration pointing in, is going to cause our velocity vector to change direction, causing the object to go around the circle. So if I were to summarize the concept right here for you, a center pointing force causes an acceleration to an object, and that acceleration doesn't occur necessarily in changing the speed, the length of the velocity vector. It, cause, it causes a change in the direction, making it a circle. Now, a few major equations that you're going to need here. Centripetal acceleration, here's my centripetal acceleration, is the velocity of the object squared divided by the radius. And since f equals ma, Maybe go ahead and put that down here, F equals MA. If I plug my A in down there, then you should be able to see that I'm left with this equation for centripetal force. There's mass times V squared over R. And if you look at it, this right here, this part right here is the centripetal acceleration. That just simply says F equals MA. Now let's come back over here to these diagrams and let's actually knock out a few very critical ideas here that we need to know. The centripetal force, and likewise, if we were to draw a vector for the centripetal acceleration, always points to the center of the circle. Make sure you write that down in your notes. The centripetal force and the centripetal acceleration both always point towards the center of the circle. And the velocity always points tangential to the circle. Um, tangential to the circle, like here's another line, tangential to the circle right, right over here. Uh, tangential to the circle, a tangent, a tangent line means it only touches the circle at one spot. Uh, another way to recognize that is that towards the center of the circle and a line tangential to the circle will always be at a right angle to each other. Um, one of the ways that we actually know that the velocity is pointing tangential to the circle is kind of this diagram over here. If we were to spin a ball on a string and then the string broke, the ball would actually go off straight. Some people incorrectly think that it would kind of curve around in larger and larger loops or that it would continue to curve like that. It's just not true. There's no force causing it to turn. If there's no force causing the velocity vector to turn, aka that there's no force causing an acceleration, it's going to continue to move off straight. Now, a couple of quick terms you might see pop up randomly uh, throughout this discussion. Period. That's the time it takes to go around one time or a revolution. So number of seconds it takes to go around once. And frequency is the number of revolutions per second. Those are actually inverses of each other. One over the frequency equals the period. We use capital T for period and F for frequency. Um, you could, of course, write that the other way, too. One over the period equals the frequency. A couple of final quick thoughts for you here um, before we get jump into some example problems. Centrifugal force is something that you hear a lot, and it's it's what you would, I'll say, feel, incorrectly feel, whenever you are the object that's actually being accelerated. Um, so if you're in a car and the car turns to the left, you feel like there is a force pushing you to the right. Now, that's not actually true. Um, it almost feels like there's a force pushing you out of the circle as opposed to into the circle. What's actually happening, we'll discuss this in class, is Newton's first law on object in motion wants to remain in motion. You're trying to go straight and the car is turning out from underneath you. Well, We'll get to that. But centrifugal force is a fictional force. It's not actually real, but it's what points. It would point out of the circle. Uh, centrifugal force is a lie. Centripetal force always points in. Now, um, centripetal force is just a label. Please make sure to understand that. Centripetal force is just a label. Centripetal force. I'm going to actually take the time to write it because it's that important. Just is just a label. What I mean by that, um, you actually 
re need to recognize that it's not some magical force that arises. It's just a name tag that we slap on other forces. For example, a few here, a string, a ball is attached to the a string and is rotating around. What is that force? It's tension in the string. Um, tension is what's actually pulling it in. A car goes around a turn. What is that force that's causing the car to go around the turn? Well, it's actually the force of friction because if the car was, uh, if the car didn't have friction between the tires and the road, whenever it turned the wheel, it would just continue to go straight. It would slip off there. So the centripetal force in that case is friction. For, let's say, a satellite orbiting the Earth, what is causing that orbit, that circular motion? The centripetal force in that case is gravity. So centripetal force is just a label there, and then we attach that label to whatever force is actually causing the object to go in a circle. All right, let's take a look at a simple example problem, a straightforward one. A car attempts to go around a turn with a radius of 46 meters. So I know my R, there's radius. The friction, the tires, uh, the friction of the car's tires can provide a maximum acceleration of 7.5 meters per second squared. That's the centripetal acceleration because in this case, the force that allows a car to go around a circle, the force that points in, that centripetal force is the force of friction here. So that must be the maximum acceleration, that must be my centripetal acceleration. Determine theoretical maximum velocity, V equals question mark, the car can go around the turn with. So I went ahead and made my variable bank and I'm gonna use the centripetal acceleration equation here, AC equals V squared over R, substitute in and begin to work my algebra. Multiply the 46 that was in the denominator over to get it to cancel out. And then finally, to get rid of the square on the V for the velocity, take the square root of both sides. Leaving me with a velocity 18.57 meters per second looks like coming back up to my problem. Here's two significant figures, two significant figures. So I only have two significant figures here making this 19 whenever I round meters per second. Now an interesting add-on to this problem down is down below. What happens whenever the road is wet, right? Whenever the road is wet, friction, the maximum acceleration is 5.2. How fast can the car go around a turn in this case? Well, all right, so it's the same equation. It's actually substituting everything in exactly the same. It's just now my AC equals V squared over R. That's just going to be 5.2 equals same turn, right, that we're trying to make it around. So same radius, 46, and we'll just solve that algebra. We end up with around 15 meters per second. If you're trying to think about that in terms of miles per hour, 15 meters per second, somewhere around 34, 35 miles per hour. 19 meters per second, on the other hand, somewhere around 42 miles per hour. So that's how fast you would be able to go in a car, theoretically here, if everything was in perfect conditions, tires or everything else, before the car would end up slipping and couldn't actually go around the turn, would slip off going straight tangential to the curve there. Um, but uh, th th that's a noticeable difference. I mean, we're, we're just under a 10 mile per hour difference here um, just because it's raining. And so that's something that you uh, hear all the time. Hey, whenever it's raining, please make sure to take it slower, especially around, around the curves. All right, let's look at another problem that adds a little bit more complexity here, and it's one that we're going to need to take some time on. Uh, a 12 kilogram bucket, that, that, that's a mass, right? 12 kilograms of water swung around horizontally. That means uh, parallel to the ground. Vertically means that you're going up and down horizontally, maybe swung horizontally over their head because they're crazy. Um, and they, they, they're not afraid of water spilling on them because they understand the idea of centripetal force. Anyway, um, uh, on a rope, if the rope uh, has a radius or a length of 0.5 meters and the bucket makes one revolution every 0.890 seconds, that's the period. I'm going to use capital T. Be careful, capital T period, capital T tension. And in this 0.5 meters, that must be the radius there that is going around because that, that's how long the, the rope is. Um, what, what acceleration must the rope be able to provide? Um, to get to get to spin around without breaking there. So my variable bank are 0 0.50 meters um, mass, which I'm actually not going to need here. We'll talk about that here. And period, 
0.890 seconds, and I'm looking for centripetal acceleration. Now, when you look at your centripetal acceleration equation, you should recognize right off the bat that this variable bank does not actually help you much here um, because you don't know the velocity. All I know is the radius. And so whenever I, whenever I plug that in, my 0.50, I'm still left with a V squared up there, and I need to solve for the centripetal acceleration. So what do you do with that? Well, here's the thing. I know another equation for velocity, the constant velocity or the average velocity equation. And really, we're looking at speed here because this equation is just dealing with the uh, with the magnitude of the velocity. But the uh, velocity equation is displacement over time, right? And so we're looking at average velocity here, which I know is zero because you go all the way around once. But we're just looking at the magnitude. Now, how far does the bucket, the displacement, go around um, in one revolution. Well, it goes around a circle, right? So velocity, in this case, because it goes all the way around the circle, would be the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi times the radius. That's the circumference here. That's the circumference equation. How long does it take to get around one time? Well, the length of time it takes to get around once is the period, capital T. So velocity equals how far it moves divided by time. If we're just looking for the average magnitude, that would be the circumference of the circle divided by the period. Now with that information, I could end up solving for velocity to then substitute in. So let's do that. And whenever I substitute in the radius and the period, as you can see I did here, I end up actually coming out with a velocity of 5.52 meters per second. That now tells me my velocity that I can substitute in. And this is a common idea that you might end up having to do where you actually need to use this idea of velocity equals displacement divided by time, circumference divided by period, and end up substituting in to solve. So now with that simple substitution done, I'm ready to plug into my calculator and actually solve this. And I end up with a centripetal acceleration that the rope has to be able to withstand or it has to be able to provide um, of 62.5 meters per second squared. Looks like I only have two sig figs in that radius up there, 0 0.50 meters. So this ends up having to round to 63 meters per second squared would be my final answer. You might say, hey, we didn't ever use the mass. Why didn't we use the mass? It was actually a distractor. Um, the mass could be used if I was asked for what was the centripetal force, right? F equals ma. I have an a here. I have my centripetal acceleration multiplied by the mass and uh, get, get the centripetal force. Um, but I do want to point out once again this idea of solving for the velocity and substituting in. Of course, this could go the opposite way. The, pro the problem could be written where you're given the centripetal acceleration and you're given the radius and you're asked for the period. And so the process then would be if you're given AC, you're given the R here, solve for the V, then take your V into this idea of 2 pi R divided by the period and solve for the period. All right, that wraps up for this video. This should have been a good overview, gotten you really uh, going on this. We'll talk about a few more details in class, try to firm all of this up. See you in class.